Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Four years ago, I found blood where it didn't belong. That was the very first time in my life that I gave serious consideration to my own mortality. Over the next couple of days, the thoughts that went through my mind were primarily characterized by worry for my wife and children and self-pity. Well, an unpleasant but harmless examination showed that there was no concern, no need to worry. This was not a fatal condition. That week or so of uncertainty about my future passed. And I have to admit, I haven't really given my mortality much thought since. But I know the clock is ticking. What will I find in my future now that I have crossed the half-century mark? You know, what health risks am I exposed to now that I live in Africa? You'd have to be crazy to move here. Think about the diseases for which there are no immunizations, like malaria, cholera, dysentery. Or think about parasites like bilharzia that can eat you from the inside out. And then there are the human-caused dangers, right? The, the crime, the violence, civil unrest. When you live in a developing country, your access to medical care is rather limited. Now, there are some private clinics here in Malawi, but if there's any serious condition that requires an operation, you have to be evacuated by airplane to another country. And thankfully, I have health insurance that covers that, but if you can't pay, then you're out of luck. Now, death isn't something that is a stranger to me. I mean, Conducting funerals is part of a minister's job. You know, for a while there in the United States, I was averaging one funeral per month for four years. What's interesting is to compare how different cultures cope with funerals. Because it tells you a little bit about the cultural attitude towards death. In the United States, it seems that we, have, we live in a culture of death denial. Everything that happens is carefully orchestrated to diminish the harsh reality of death. There's soft music playing in the background. The lights are dimmed to reduce the the harshness of the shadows. Morticians are experts at creating the illusion of sleep through makeup and hairdressing. They help in a great way to lessen the reality that this person is no longer in this world. The coffins that are used in traditional burials are are beautiful with metal and wood, highly polished. Then after the ceremony, of course, there's a formal ride out to the cemetery as if it's a presidential cortege being escorted to an important event. I've seen at many funerals the photo montages, boards with pictures from the deceased's life, showing them engaged in all kinds of various stages of their life when they were younger, when they were at their middle of their ages, when they were senior citizens thing, doing things with their grandchildren, their different family members. In the United States, it's become popular to call these events not funerals, but celebrations of life in which 
the the main focus of of the attention is on the wonderful things that this person was able to accomplish in his or her life and and the mean, and the significance that they played in the lives of the people who are grieving their loss and again that there's nothing wrong with any of that i understand that person is a every person is a is a wonderful gift from god to the world and those are blessings that god should be thanked for that's how funerals are conducted in the united states in my limited experience as, as a minister in other parts of the world i would say that the reality of death is is more in your face it's raw the coffins are simple maybe made out of plain pine boards and many many times there is no mortician to provide care for the physical container of a person's soul so when you're in a hot climate you have to hurry because the reality is decon- decomposition starts immediately at death i've accompanied people as they've carried the mortal remains of their loved one to the cemetery walking on foot or having the coffin placed in the back of a of a pickup truck or even carried in the back of a of an ox cart dragged by hand one of the saddest funerals that i have attended here in africa was that of a 19-year-old girl who was the daughter of a pastor of our fellowship who died complications of diabetes unexpected of course as all deaths are and all youth funerals i would say no matter what country you live in are are sad affairs and produce a greater outpouring of grief but i will never forget the pictures in my mind of all of her young friends forming a circle around her grave and each one with a single red rose and then planting it into the dirt together in unison there are different funeral customs all over the world and the sense of loss is the same no matter where you live in the world but it is expressed quite differently by different people in different cultures in my cultural upbringing in the northern part of the united states people tend to be quietly stoic at funerals to can bottle up all their emotions and, and not let on that anything is disturbing them and then after the fact they spend quite a considerable time dealing with that pain now in other countries what i've observed is that at the day of the funeral there are loud expressions of grief wailing and, and crying in ways which i have never experienced before in my home country but then after the funeral those mourners get on with it and they stoically carry on their way so which is better i don't know it's the same grief either way it's just a different way of processing it and i think that it's a fallacy that life is more dangerous in africa than in the united states i think that the covid epidemic has demonstrated effectively that anybody can die anywhere in the world and mortality is a condition that affects all people because it's a consequence of humanity's rebellion against god in the bible it says that god created the first human beings and gave them a command not to eat a certain fruit because in that day they would certainly die and because adam and eve disobeyed god and ate that fruit they died and their children died and their grandchildren all descendants of the first human beings are born with that clock ticking yes we all will die but that's not even the worst of it in the book of romans it says the wages of sin is death 
That is true, that we will die physically. But what then? What is the consequence of dying when you are in a state of sin? The Bible says that those who fail to live up to God's standard of perfection deserve eternal punishment in hell. And again, that is not something that people like to consider. Not only the fact that we are going to physically die someday, but also the fact that there will be an accounting afterwards for which we will have to give an answer to the deeds of our lives. And all of us will be found sorely lacking. We should thank God when there are reminders in our lifetime to consider our own mortality and to consider the reality of that final reckoning. My wife and I decided one morning to have breakfast outside. It wasn't something that we did on a regular basis, but the weather is rather pleasant here in the tropics, and it was a nice sunny day. So we set up a table at the base of the bottle brush tree in our backyard. Pleasant wind was blowing. We had a beautiful time together. After we ate, we cleared the dishes, went back inside the house. About a half an hour later, as I was sitting at my desk, I heard a loud crashing noise. I went outside and I saw that one of the branches from that bottle brush tree had broken off and fallen exactly on the spot where my wife and I had been enjoying our meal a half an hour earlier. You know, if that branch had fallen the moment in which my wife and I were sitting there having our breakfast, it's very likely that one or both of us would have been hurt, or maybe worse. And I thank God for sparing my life, and I also thank God for giving me that opportunity to reflect once again on the fact that I am a mortal human being. In the book of Galatians, chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, God set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his Son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I have been walking in danger from the very moment that I was conceived. God knows the number of the hairs on my head and my days on earth. And God has also made me know that my days belong to him. God knows how many days are allotted to every human being, including his own son, Jesus. Jesus, as God's son, also knew that his time on earth was limited. He had 33 years. That's all he got on earth. 33 years in which to do his work. 33 years in which to right every single wrong that has ever been committed by humanity or ever will be. Jesus had 33 years, and in really only the last three years he used to travel around the country to preach his message of repentance and forgiveness, to instruct his disciples, to perform his miracles, to demonstrate his power and authority. And then at the end, he experienced the most brutal kind of humiliation and death that was known to humanity at that time. And Jesus redeemed the days of every human being that's ever lived or ever will live on this world by giving up his own life. And so that man who wrote the book of Galatians chapter 1, that man who said that God had set him apart from his mother's womb, chosen him to be his apostle, that man, the apostle Paul, oh, he was a he was an evil man. He was a violent man, a murderer, a persecutor of Christians, a persecutor of Christ himself. But the thing is, Jesus knew all those things about him even before he was born. 
And yet Jesus gave up his life for a guy like that. And that is why Jesus did not smite the Apostle Paul as he was on his way to arrest and kill even more Christians in the city of Damascus. If that's true for Paul, that's true for me too. God knows I have not been perfect and knows that I never will be. God knew about all the failures that I would perform, all the things that I am ashamed to even admit to myself that I have done. God knows exactly where my life's path is headed. But because of his son and his sacrifice, that's why I'm still here today. That's why I was born and that's why I live. And of course, Jesus' story didn't end on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And Gary Habermas has developed the case for Christ's resurrection in, in an awesome way. If you ever have the chance to read his book, he gives some basic facts about the resurrection story that prove he actually indeed did rise from the dead. Gary Habermas talks about Jesus' body never being found. He talks about the changed character of the disciples, how they went from being terrified to bold proclaimers of, of the message of, of Christ's gospel. He talks about the changed life of the Apostle Paul, who I mentioned from a persecutor of Christians to the greatest apostle of, of the New Testament. And he mentions Jesus' brother, James, who the Gospels say at one point did not believe his brother was the Messiah, the Son of God. But eventually James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read these words, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And I think about what the Apostle Paul wrote there about groaning. There are plenty of days when I wake up with aching groans, my old body is getting older and weaker. My memory is failing. It isn't what it used to be. I see plenty of younger people with much more strength and energy than I have. Don't get me wrong. I'm not ready to cash it in yet. I, I love my life. I, I, I like to take care of myself by eating right kinds of foods and, and trying to get some regular exercise. But I know the day is coming when I will need to pack it in and roll up the tent of my earthly body. I know that clock is ticking and I know that my date in God's court is swiftly approaching, but I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid and it has nothing to do with the fact that I've been a, a missionary or a pastor or a father or a husband or anything that I've done. Well, I know that my when my court case comes before the divine judge, the verdict will be not guilty because Jesus has served my sentence already and Jesus has provided a, a pure record in my place. And so I know where I'm headed. And you do too. When the time comes for you to leave this world, Jesus has reserved a deluxe suite for you and for me 
at his father's heavenly lodge. The next time on Home Ties, when you move around frequently, as I have during my lifetime, it means that you become a jack of all trades, but master of none. You need lots of patience to figure out what it is that you're able to do and what you shouldn't do. We'll see you next time.